three centuries, the Nordic warriors known as Vikings dominated Europe, raiding and settling lands from Ireland to Italy. According to contemporary accounts, they were invading hordes that murdered for sport. But Vikings were also master shipbuilders, devout missionaries, and above all else, courageous explorers. Even a thousand years after the Viking glory days, their influence resonates throughout our culture. Join us for Vikings, Fury from the North. July 2000. In the calm summer waters off Canada's eastern province of Newfoundland, a sight not seen here for a millennium appears on the horizon. A fleet of Viking ships. As part of a year-long celebration commemorating the Viking discovery of North America a thousand years ago, more than a dozen replica Viking ships have sailed here from as far away as Scandinavia. Their destination is the only authenticated Viking colony in the Western Hemisphere, Lonzo Meadows, located at the northern tip of Newfoundland. As the ships slowly sail into the bay, the waiting crowd cheers their arrival. But a thousand years ago, the approach of Viking ships would have produced terror. When a Viking ship hoves on the horizon, you send out the word, lads, look out, the Vikings are about. Who were the Vikings, and what lured them to sail to the ends of the known world? The term Viking has its origins in the old Norse word vik, meaning bay. These seafarers first made their appearance along northern European trading routes in the 7th century AD. Originally, the Viking homelands made up the Scandinavian countries known today as Norway, Denmark, and Sweden. Vast stretches of dense forest and high mountains, broken only by broad inlets or fjords. It is from these sheltered waters that the Norsemen of the 8th century first go a Viking. But why? There were a number of different factors which prompted people in the Viking period to go Viking. Uh, one, of course, was better weather. In the 7th century, ice sheets all over the world recede. The earth becomes a warmer place, providing a longer growing season in the north the population swells. So you had a lot of people in a finite amount of space, and many of them were developing very sharp elbows. That just wasn't room for all of them within Scandinavia. At the same time, Viking shipbuilders make a technological breakthrough. I think the basis for their success must be the Viking boat. They had invented a new type of boat that went much faster than earlier types. Historians first uncover evidence of these ships in April of 1880. On a farm overlooking Oslo Fjord near the small village of Gokstad, a curious farmer begins digging into a huge mound of earth on his land. Known as the King's Mound, legends tell that a Viking warlord and all his treasure lay buried beneath it. Archaeologists who take over the dig find an astonishingly well-preserved Viking ship that had been deliberately buried. Scientific dating places the burial around the year 850 AD, the dawn of the Viking Age. Aboard the ship in a tent covered over with clay, diggers find the body of a Viking chieftain. Interred with him are all the supplies and tools a warrior might need in the afterlife. But the prize discovery is the ship itself, measuring 76 feet from stem to stern and finely crafted from solid oak. The Gokstad ship represents a quantum leap in shipbuilding. No other seafaring culture of the time could build such a swift yet sturdy craft. Its solid keel and shallow draft make it an extremely nimble ship, capable of crossing vast oceans or sailing up shallow rivers. As their shipbuilding technology advanced, they could simply apply their rules and navigational aids and all the rest of it to uh, traveling greater distances. 
The kind of vessel found at Gokstad is an early warship. The Vikings would eventually develop this design into a fearsome new weapon. The Viking Dragon Ship. They did manage to come to the shore very rapidly, and then they could disappear quickly as well. The year is 793. On the small island of Lindisfarne, off the east coast of England, the monks of St. Cuthbert's Monastery are going about their daily routines. All of a sudden, out of the sea, that one element that they always saw as protecting them became the greatest danger. The pagans from the northern region came and overran the country in all directions, like fierce wolves, plundering, tearing, and killing not only sheep and oxen, but priests, and choirs of monks and nuns. Monasteries were richly apparelled in, in all sorts of ecclesiastical bits and pieces, paraphernalia, whether it was crosses, reliquary boxes, all sorts of rich, bejeweled, gold and silver stuff. And that's what the Vikings wanted. The attack on Lindisfarne is the opening salvo in a 200-year Viking assault on the Western world. From the British Isles to the steppes of Russia, from the Holy Roman Empire to Moorish North Africa, no one is safe from the heathen onslaught. When we return, Europe succumbs to the Viking offensive. And on Easter Sunday of all days, 845, the Vikings enter the city of Paris um, undefended and uh, proceed to sack it. The familiar vision of Vikings wearing horned helmets is actually a myth. The image was apparently popularized by scenic designers working on Richard Wagner's 19th century operas. History's Mysteries will return on the History Channel. We now return to Vikings Fury from the North on History's Mysteries. The attack on the English monastery of Lindisfarne in 793 marks the beginning of an all-out offensive by Vikings, attracted by the growing wealth of Christian Europe. The uh, beginning of the Viking Age comes at a time when Charlemagne is the ruler of northern Europe. The scholar Alcuin, an English monk in the court of the Holy Roman Emperor Charlemagne, writes, never before has such a terror appeared in Britain and never was such a landing from sea thought possible. Charlemagne built up the defenses of the continent against Viking attacks deliberately and consciously and was able to maintain a system that prevented the Vikings from serious inroads into the continent. Following his death in 814, his son, Louis the Pious, was less careful. Soon, Viking ships are a familiar sight all along the northern coast of France and throughout the British Isles. Attacks are frequent and brutal. Their biggest asset was surprise. They were past masters of the hit and run, smash and grab raid. In 845, a Viking fleet of 120 ships sails up the River Seine. Led by the Danish chieftain Ragnar, their goal is the rich farmlands of the Marne Valley beyond Paris. Ragnar leather pants, as he comes to be known, for these great woolly, woolly pants. There is a Viking who is, uh, in the true sense of the word, a, a rascal and a great warrior and adventurous. King Charles the Bald quickly gathers an army and races to intercept the Vikings. But as the massive Norse fleet approaches, Charles foolishly tries to defend both banks of the river. In effect, what Charles has done is cut his forces in half. The Vikings quickly overwhelm the smaller French army, taking more than a hundred prisoners. Then, as a lesson in Viking ruthlessness, Ragnar hangs his captives in full view of their comrades. The Vikings meet with no further resistance as they forge ahead toward a rich prize. 
And on Easter Sunday of all days, 8.45, Ragnar enters the city of Paris, undefended, and proceeds to sack it. Hoping to salvage the city, Charles offers to pay in silver if the Vikings will leave. It is the first of many payments made to the Vikings known as Danegeld, meaning literally Danish money or payment. You can't beat them militarily, let's buy them off. And for Ragnar, it was the payment of 7,000 pounds of silver that Charles the Bald gave him, with the understanding that he would not come back. But Danegeld is a strategy doomed to failure, for it only encourages the raiders to return time and again. If payments are not met, the Vikings punish their victims by cutting a slit in a nostril. The term paying through the nose is still used today. Yet some well-organized efforts are able to resist Viking aggression. After sacking Seville, the capital of Moorish Spain, the Vikings suffer a bitter defeat. The Moors fight back by hurling fireballs at the Viking fleet in the Guadalquivir River, sinking 30 ships. So many Norsemen are taken prisoner by the Moors that the gallows of Seville cannot hold them. All the rest are hung from the city's date palms. For the most part, however, the Vikings remain unstoppable. In the late 9th century, Vikings raid cities around the Mediterranean as far as Constantinople. By the early 10th century, the Vikings achieve their only permanent foothold in Western Europe. In 911, an enormous armada of Viking ships lands at the mouth of the River Seine in France. Leading the invasion is the Viking chieftain known as Rolf the Walker, who earned the nickname because he was too large for any horse to carry. Unable to fight them off, the French king decides to offer the Norsemen a treaty, ceding them the land if they will defend it from other Viking attacks. And in this treaty, Rolf, who in France comes to be known as Rollo, agrees to convert to Christianity in return for settling the lands at the mouth of the Seine. The new kingdom, destined to be the most powerful in Europe, is named for the French term for the Vikings, Nordmani, or Normandy. By 912, Rollo and his men make good on their bargain by converting to the Christian faith. But the Norse way of life does not thrive here. The Vikings tended to assimilate very rapidly those people who went abroad on ships, especially to Europe, taking lands by force in England and in France and places like that. They were basically young men, and they took native wives. Within a few decades, even the Norse language is all but forgotten. And yet, the Viking taste for conquest would not die. When we return, the Viking conquest of England leaves a lasting legacy. It is a system where the Vikings, to settle a dispute, will have 12 individuals who speak for one side or the other. Elsewhere in the world, around the year 1000, in Norway, King Olaf decreed that all lands under his control, including Iceland, were officially Christian. In Italy, musician Guido of Arezzo invented the parallel lines known in music as the staff. And in China, alchemists devised an early version of gunpowder for use in fireworks. To search anytime in history, please visit the World Timeline at historychannel.com. We now return to Vikings, Fury from the North, on History's Mysteries. The modern city of York in northern England enjoys an ancient heritage. The Romans came here because it was a good military base, a naturally defensible position. 